Hey guys, Carlson here to talk about Unit 5, our last unit of the semester. We're going to cover Chapter 16 of the Digestive System today and just go through 16.4. Um, if you've ever heard the saying, I have a gut feeling, or you want to chew on this, or I might find something or someone's opinion hard to swallow, we're referring to the functions of the digestive system, which we really don't think about until things go wrong. So we use a lot of preventative measures like brushing our teeth, using mouthwash, taking dietary supplements and acids and laxatives to make sure our digestive system continues working properly so it can help us obtain essential nutrients through anabolism and catabolism. Um, the process of digestion and the removal of organic waste is a primary function of the digestive tract and we're going to get into the details here now. So section one just kind of goes through what cut what is in the digestive tract and the accessory organs that help perform these food processing functions. So. Um, just know that you may hear that I just tract as called the GI tract or the alimentary canal means the same thing and each division of the tract is going to overlap somewhat in function but also has specialized areas. We're not going to talk too much about the accessory organs of the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas today but they are part of the digestive tract. The main ones we're going to talk about are the tongue, teeth, the salivary glands, and then your stomach. Now, the main functions of the digestive tract are listed here. They are ingestion, mechanical processing, digestion, secretion, absorption, and then finally excretion or removal of waste products through defecation of feces. So kind of take a quick look and jot down those definitions of each function to make sure you know exactly what we mean by them. Now, the lining of the digestive tract plays defensive roles as well. It protects tissues from those acids and enzymes that are used to break down our foods, as well as protect against bacteria. And we'll talk more about that bacteria protection later on. Here is a picture of the components of the digestive system where I'm going to focus today on the oral cavity, the pharynx, esophagus, and stomach. And then I'll talk a little bit about the salivary glands. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to pause and just make a quick drawing of the digestive system itself and maybe even jot down those major and accessory organs. Now the histological organization of the GI tract includes four major layers of mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and serosa. And so just by looking at their names it kind of tells you what they're made up of. And I have a lot of information here but I'm not going to talk about it all. Um, the mucosa is a mucous membrane that's moistened by secretions. It's along most of the tract and thrown into folds to increase uh, surface area for absorption through those villi. It also permits expansion and lines the oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, and anus because this is where mechanical stresses are most severe. So stratified squamous is the best cell type in that area. The submucosa is a dense irregular connective tissue that's going to connect that mucosa to the muscularis externa and it contains a network of nerve fibers known as a submucosal plexus that controls the smooth muscle of the muscularis externa. Uh, it will agitate and propel materials forward in this area or help the muscular externa helps to make that happen in the digestive tract and then it's controlled by a network of nerves called the myenteric plexus. Uh, finally we have the serosa which is a serous membrane. It covers the muscular externa and is enclosed by the peritoneal cavity. And just be aware there are some portions of the tract that are su suspended by mesenteries. These are double sheets of membranes that give us a pathway of blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels to the tract itself. And you can see each area here. Here are those mesenteries that I talked about. Uh, you can see the artery vein. Um, so it's providing uh, an area for blood to contact the tract. You have the mucosa again. It, it has these folds that are aligned with villi for that absorption piece. The submucosa connecting the mucosa to the muscularis externa, and then you have the serosa that's lining the entire tract. All right, how does uh, digestive materials actually get through uh, the system? Well, pace setter cells in the smooth muscle of the GI will trigger waves of contractions, and it's very rhythmic. Uh, it's known as peristalsis. And so that's where the movement occurs or how it occurs. And segmentation is a process that actually has a mechanical mixing going on of the bolus itself. And so this uh, peristalsis, it, it starts off initially just m movement through from mouth to anus. And once we need to push uh, through that bolus, a contraction will occur. And um, those contractions will actually help this circular muscle layer uh, provide a force that's going to push it the bolus forward and that continues throughout the digestive tract in different areas. Now 
We're going to talk about the oral cavity in section two, which is also known as a buccal cavity. It's a part of the tract that receives food and it's lined by stratified squamous. Its uh, functions are to sense and analyze materials, uh, process them with the teeth, tongue, and palate, lubricate with mucus and then gland secretions, and then provide salivary enzymes to begin the digestion of carbs and lipids. Make sure you're familiar with these terms. Uh, the labia are the lips, which is there's upper and a lower portion. The gingiva are the gums. The palate is the roof of the mouth, which is hard and soft. The lingual frenulum is the anterior connection of the tongue, which is right here, and the uvula, which is that soft angling tissue that prevents food from going down too quickly into the esophagus. Now, your tongue itself is the part that helps with mechanical manipulation of food. It's, it has that sensory analysis, and the base of the tongue is home to those lingual tonsils, which are lymphoid nodules that help resist infection, which are sometimes removed if they do get infected or cause a lot of problems. Uh, your salivary glands are in three different pairs. There's a large parotid, sublingual, and then the submandibular. And you can uh, see those each here. So you have your large parotid and then the submandibular and the sublingual. Uh, they make about 1 to 1.5 liters of saliva each day, which is 99.4% water and then other part, uh, something we call mucin. This is where that lubrication comes from. Coats food to reduce friction when swallowing, also helps with bacterial control, and provides us with that salivary amylase, which breaks down those starches. Now our teeth, uh, they perform the chewing or the mastication of food. The bulk of a tooth consists of dentin, which is a bone-like matrix, but without cells, and the types are the incisors, cuspids, bicuspids, or premolar and molars. The incisors are right in the front of the mouth, and there's also one in the lower teeth, and then the uh, canines are the cuspids that you see, and those are the ones that do the tearing and slashing of food. Now, we all know that there is dental succession. This is where we have our baby teeth, and we lose them, and then we get our secondary teeth. Now, those baby teeth are known as deciduous teeth because deciduous means to fall off. There are about 20 of them. And then the permanent dentition or the secondary teeth come in through the process of eruption. And then our adult mouth will include 32 teeth. Uh, I know we all, a lot of us get our wisdom teeth cut out, and these teeth form in areas that do not erupt, and they're called impacted teeth, so if those areas get infected, that's when they have to come out because they will never erupt. Now, section three talks about the pharynx, and it's the passageway between the oral cavity and the esophagus. Um, it's also known as the throat. It's a common passageway for solids, foods, uh, solid foods, liquid or air, and there are three subdivisions of the pharynx. Uh, muscle contractions during swallowing help force food masses through the esophagus. And that esophagus is 25 centimeters long, about 2 centimeters wide, and it's a muscular tube. Passes through the thoracic cavity to empty into the stomach and the abdominal pelvic cavity. It's lined with that stratified squamous, like I mentioned. It resists abrasion, hot and cold temperatures, and chemical attacks. Um, the swallowing process actually starts in the buccal phase. Okay, which begins in the mouth, and then we'll talk about how that moves on to the pharynx phase in a second. Uh, this phase, though, the buccal phase, is the only one that is a controlled phase of swallowing. The rest of them uh, occur through the nervous system atom atomically. And then, so swallowing is also known as deglutition, and it's a complex process that can be initiated voluntarily, like I said, with the buccal phase, but then proceeds automatically. Uh, once food is approved by the tongue receptors, debris is compacted into that small mass that I referred to as a bolus earlier. So the pharyngeal phase comes in when the bolus comes into contact with the palatal arches and the posterior pharyngeal wall. And so you can see that the bolus has kind of reached this area of the pharynx. Then we move on to the esophageal phase. This begins as a contraction of pharyngeal muscles, forces a bolus to enter the esophagus. And then finally, we finish swallowing, uh, which takes about nine seconds to reach the stomach. Uh, liquids take a few seconds, and then the dry, a dry bolus cannot be swallowed. Um, so it's very important that those lubrication um, occurs with those salivary glands. And so once the bolus enters the stomach, basically swallowing has complete. Okay, so finally moving on to section four, we're going to talk about the J-shaped stomach. It receives the bolus from the esophagus and aids in chemical and mechanical digestion. So the stomach we know is lined by that peritoneal cavity. Um, it is right here. 
And uh, this is a temporary storage of ingested food. Again, mechanical breakdown, uh, breakdown of chemical bonds uh, so that the enzymes can uh, start acting. And then it's, it also helps play a role in production of this, what we call intrinsic factor. It's a compound necessary for absorption of vitamin B12. And we're gonna talk about what that does in a second. Uh, there are four main regions of the stomach, the uh, cardia right here, which is the smallest region, the fundus, which is the bulged area of the stomach superior to the cardia, uh, the body, which is a large area between the fundus and the curve of the J right here, and so this area here, the pylorus, is a distal part of the J that connects uh, the stomach to the small intestine. Now, there is a sphincter that regulates the flow of chyme, okay, right here, it's a pylorus sphincter, and chyme is a highly acidic soupy mixture of partially digest food that was completed by the stomach that will continue to move through the digestive system. Now, the regulation of gastric activity um, occurs in a few different phases, but just know that the stomach is lined with simple columnar epithelial that's dominated by mucus cells. Uh, gastric glands of the fundus are dominated by para parietal and chief cells and then these cells are going to produce about 15 milliliters of gastric juice. The parietal cells are important because they secrete intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid. Uh, remember I said that intrinsic factor is going to aid in absorption of vitamin B12. This is needed for urethropoiesis which is a formation of red blood cells. Um, hydrochloric acid keeps acidity high to kill microorganisms and stimulate those chief cells which are going to secrete protein known as pepsinogen that converts to pepsin, which digests our proteins. So you can see a close-up here of one of the gastric glands, and you can see where the parietal cells and chief cells are kind of embedded into um, that area. Um, there are three overlapping phases of secretion. So we have the cephalic phase, which is where the preparation of the stomach to receive ingested materials occurs. We have the gastric phase, which begins with arrival of food. Um, is demonstrated here, and then we have the intestinal phase, which controls the rate of gastric emptying. So you can see that's happening in this lower portion here. All right, so the digestion is incomplete at this state where we are leaving the stomach. Once chyme leaves the stomach, though, most of the carbs, lipids, and proteins are only partially broken down. Um, and this is just prepping uh, that material for chemical digestion, which is gonna occur in the intestine, which we'll talk about in 16.5. Uh, so that's the highlight of that's going to be the small intestine digests and absorbs nutrients. So we'll save that for later. Uh, you're definitely going to probably have to pause and play in this one because I talk pretty fast. Um, and I'll see you guys next time.